Welcome back, students. In the last lecture, we saw how to set up an electrochemical cell and that we could compare the cell EMF, which is our E value, um, to thermodynamic uh, properties. We'll start by doing the equilibrium constant today. We didn't have time for that last time and then continue on to some other uh, things. So the learning goal to, for today is going to be to see how we can use the electrochemistry to determine the activity coefficient for uh, certain species in solution. And remember this activity coefficient is gonna modify how a ionic species will actually act in solution. And then with the rest of our time, we're going to talk about batteries and fuel cells, and we'll go through some of the reactions that power common batteries that we are used to. We'll start by looking at equilibrium by considering the reaction that we used last time, the reaction from the Daniel cell between zinc and copper. The EMF for this reaction is 1.10 volts, and plugging that into the equation below, we find that the Gibbs free energy for this reaction is approximately negative 212 kilojoules per mole. So what does this say about equilibrium? We can simply evaluate the equilibrium constant because we know that the natural log of the equilibrium constant is equal to negative delta G naught over RT. So plugging that in, we can find out that the equilibrium constant is equal to E raised to the negative delta G over RT. What you can see here is that if uh, delta G is negative 212, that's going to be a very large number. So negative delta G over RT is going to be negative negative 212. So that's going to be 212,000 joules per mole divided by 298R, where R is our 8.314 in joules per mole Kelvin. And that ends up getting us approximately E to the 85.7, which is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the 37. In other words, a very huge equilibrium constant. So we can see for this reaction, this lies almost exclusively with the products. Um, we would have approximately, uh, you know, 10 to the 37 uh, copper atoms for every zinc atom uh, in the metallic form. So we're not going to actually be able to measure a good equilibrium constant for this if we wait to equilibrium, and we need the voltage to actually help us describe this. We can see a general form of this, which is basically what we've just done uh, using the Nernst equation and setting the uh, voltage equal to zero, which is what would happen at equilibrium, and then Q becomes K. And what we see is basically the equation that we've just done. The standard uh, cell EMF is equal to RT over N F times the natural log of K. So with this, we can get a good relationship between the measured voltage and also the equilibrium constant. In addition to very favorable reactions, cell EMF can also be used to determine the equilibrium constant for very unfavorable reactions. Uh, for salts that dissolve normally, we can find the equilibrium constant by measuring the conductivity of the solution. But if we have something that's not very soluble, we're not going to be able to dissolve enough ions to actually get a good read for the conductivity of solution. So how do we measure the equilibrium constant? Well, we can measure the voltage. Consider the following reactions. So we can describe the uh, loss of an electron of silver bromide. So if we have a silver bromide salt, we add an electron and that would make solid silver and uh, aqueous bromide. And we can describe this as a half cell. It has a half cell potential of 0 0.07133 volts. We can consider another reaction that is the donation of an electron from silver. So we can have solid silver going to uh, aqueous silver with an electron, and that has a half cell potential of negative 0 0.7996 volts. Um, and then we can put these two together to have a net reaction. So if we added these two together, we would cancel out the electron, we'd cancel out the solid silver, and we'd end up with the reaction talking about silver bromide going into dissolved silver and dissolved bromide. Adding up the uh, half cell potentials here, we would get the cell, uh, uh, EMF for the reaction, 
of negative 0.7283 volts. And we can recognize that with a negative cell potential, that is an overall unfavorable process. So we can take this, plug it in here, and figure out what the equilibrium constant is um, using this equation. So the natural log of our equilibrium constant here, it's a KSP because it's a not very soluble salt as uh, demonstrated by the very negative uh, cell EMF. Uh, we can say this is equal to NF over RT times E naught. Plugging in numbers here, we get an answer of negative 28.35. Here we use an N of one because we were talking about one electron being transferred. Um, and then when we take this, we take e to the negative 23.85, we get a value for KSP of 4.88 times 10 to the minus 13. So a very unfavorable reaction. However, we can actually measure the voltage between these two things and get an, an estimation for the equilibrium constant for this. We can also use electrochemical cells to determine the activity coefficient for solutes. So let's consider a different reaction here. Let's consider a reaction by which we have a silver half cell. So we have aqueous silver uh, gaining an electron and becoming metallic silver. And just like we saw, this has a cell uh, reduction potential of 0 0.7996 volts. And then we'll also have the hydrogen cell. So if we have uh, one half of gaseous hydrogen reacting to become uh, aqueous dissolved hydrogen plus an electron. Uh, and this, of course, has a cell EMF of zero. That's the definition of this uh, reaction. So adding these things together, we would have a reaction that says uh, aqueous silver plus one half uh, hydrogen gas reacts to form solid silver plus aqueous hydrogen. And the overall cell EMF would simply be the overall cell EMF for the silver uh, reaction because the hydrogen is defined as zero. We know that if we have one molar concentrations of, of reactants and products, which we would need to actually measure a standard uh, potential here, our activity coefficients are gonna be pretty great. Um, so we know that at very low concentrations, the activity coefficient, which remember, if we have the activity of a substance, it's equal to the activity coefficient times the molality or the concentration, depending on the units that you're using. Um, so at very low concentrations, the activity coefficient gamma here is approximately one, but at higher concentrations, if you would be at one molar, that activity co coefficient can be significant um, and cause a change in apparent concentration. Um, so if we want to determine uh, things about reactions, it's actually much more useful to do that at low concentrations, but then we can't use our standard equation because we're not at standard conditions. Um, so instead we'll turn to the Nernst equation to help sort this out for us. So the Nernst equation says that the cell EMF at some different concentration is equal to the standard cell EMF minus RT over NF times the natural log of Q, where Q is the reactant quotient. Um, here, the reactant quotient can be described as, as always, it's products over reactants. Um, in this case, our products are uh, a solid metal, and this standard dissolved hydrogen, where the activity is set and defined as one for this standard state. The reactants are then uh, a gas in its standard state, and also uh, silver. So the only thing we need to consider in this case is the activity of silver, since the activity for hydrogen is defined as one being our standard state and our, our solid silver is a pure metal. So we can say then that our Q is equal to one over the activity of ionic silver. Uh, in this case, we can rewrite this as follows. We have our standard uh, cell EMF, minus RT over NF natural log one over the activity of silver. Using log properties, we can invert that and change the sign and say this is equal to a standard uh, cell uh, uh, EMF plus now RT over NF, now natural log of the activity of silver. And then we'll define the activity of silver as 
the uh, activity coefficient times the molality. And this will allow us to say that the cell EMF is equal to the standard cell EMF plus RT over NF natural log of the molality of silver over a standard molality, which is one molal. Um, and then we'll have another term plus RT over NF that describes the activity coefficient. And we have to use this plus minus activity coefficient because we can never have pure silver. We always have this coupled to some negative ion. Since we're gonna be doing this for very dilute uh, solutions uh, and dilute concentrations, we can bring in the Debye-Huckel limiting law to estimate the activity coefficient based on the molality. And so the equation that we had from a couple lectures ago was that the log base 10 of our activity coefficient is equal to negative 0.5092 times the square root of the molality divided by its standard molality. So what we're going to do then is plug this guy in here, and then we'll do some rearranging and actually plugging in values for the constants to get a nice equation that we can fit. And we'll have to do a little bit of a conversion to convert to log base 10. What we end up getting is something that kind of looks interesting here. And we're gonna bring the log term of the molality to one side and leave the square root from the other side. So what we'll end up with is as follows. We'll end up with E minus 0 0.05916 times the log base 10 of the uh, molality over its standard state. So this essentially comes from this part here. We plug in RT over NF and then we do a conversion to log base 10. And then what's left over is E naught minus 0 0.03011 times the square root of M over M naught, uh, which again is RT over NF and then converting from logs to natural logs and so forth. Um, so what we get is this equation. Now we'll see on the slides what we can do with this is that we can plot this Y axis against this on the X axis. Now, so if you look at this plot here, if we extrapolate back to m over uh, m is equal to zero. We extrapolate back and then we get uh, this term here where uh, our log of our molality becomes one. And so E minus 0.05961, we can get a value for what our E naught is uh, for this equation. So doing that, we know what E naught is. It's whatever this zero point is there. Why do we need to do that? Well, once we know what E naught is, we can know how it deviates from ideal uh, based on the activity. So we extrapolate back, we find E naught. And then from here, we know what E naught is. We know what the molality is at all of these points. And we know how it deviates. So we can say that E is equal to E naught, this uh, value here, plus this term for the molality. And then we can actually calculate what the activity coefficient is based on how it's deviating here. Uh, and so this is a pretty powerful tool for us to actually be able to evaluate activity coefficients at a variety of concentrations, which then can be used to do extremely accurate calculations when that's required. There's some abbreviated nomenclature that I'll just briefly introduce you to. You might see it. We're not going to use it in this class, but you might see it if you go off into other classes. Um, and that is this right here. So this is an abbreviated nomenclature that essentially says what's happening in this process is that zinc is in equilibrium with zinc sulfate and copper is in equilibrium with copper sulfate. And our zinc all the way on the left side is moving electrons to the copper all the way on the right side. And that's how to read these sorts of abbreviated nomenclatures here. Um, and this is a little bit more easy than writing out half cells and balanced reactions and so forth. Uh, and sometimes it, you might see this depending on the field that you go into. I'll also mention that there's some other weird kinds of electrodes that exist. So there's gas and aqueous electrodes like we've seen with the hydrogen half cell, but they could also do this with chlorine gas and so forth. There can be um, uh, metal ions. That's what we've been using mostly. So zinc, uh, metal, and zinc ion solutions. But you could also do things like salt uh, into metals and ions or even ions into ions, depending on the type of reaction that, that's happening. And you need a different kind of setup for each of these. And we're not going to focus on this too much in class, but I want you to be aware that they do exist.
The very detailed tables of the standard reduction potentials can be reduced down to this electrochemical series for easy access. Um, this electrochemical series is listed with the most strongly reducing metals at the top and the least strongly reducing metals on the bottom. This is for the kind of standard ionic state of these metals, what they normally go into. Uh, and so looking at this, we could easily tell what something would do. So for example, zinc here is below copper, so electrons would flow from zinc to copper. But if we put copper, hooked it up with silver, the electrons would flow from copper to silver. Um, we could look down here at uh, so sodium. Sodium is going to give electrons to most other things, except for kind of the guys below it on the periodic table. And this is something that we can easily use to invest evaluate some normal kind of electrodes that we might encounter. Um, it doesn't have all the detail that a more complicated table would. The last part of class, we're going to look at how we actually apply electrochemistry in our daily lives. Uh, typically, we do this with batteries. So batteries store both cells together for our, our electrochemical reaction and allow electrons to flow once the battery is connected to whatever it ends up being connected to. The electrons, just like always, move from this the chemical with the lower reduction potential to the higher one, and it goes through the electronic device where the battery is hooked into and actually powers the device, whether it's a light bulb um, or a cell phone or a, a Game Boy, as my mom would say back when I was a kid, that's what I always use batteries for. Um, and, and that is what is happening with these batteries. Now, batteries store all of the reactants in the battery. And once the reaction is already fully completed to the products, the battery stops and the device dies. Uh, today, we've gotten pretty good with batteries and we can put them in our cell phone and actually recharge them, but then we have to plug our, our cell phone in and we can't use it as much as, much as we'd like to. Um, researchers are trying to develop uh, economical fuel cells, which essentially do the same thing as a battery where we use an electrochemical reaction to power some sort of device, but they allow for a continuous input of reactants much like an engine. So you can think of your, your car engine and that allows oxygen and uh, gasoline to flow into the engine and continuously combust and continue to do work. You don't ever run out of something, you can run out of gas of course, um, but you don't run out of a reaction and have to recharge that. We can compare fuel cells to combustion engines and see that the fuel cells compare favorably. So in a fuel cell, all of the energy is electrochemical in nature, meaning it's non-expansion work. And in theory, we can harvest all of the non-expansion work into mechanical work because the uh, non-expansion work is equal to delta G. So we can take all of that and put it into whatever work we wanna do. Now, in practice, of course, that's not something that's feasible, but it theoretically is possible, unlike our expansion work, which is theoretically not possible to get 100% work out. Um, so we can compare the two uh, types of work. Um, so the work for a combustion reaction we decided was Q hot, which is the amount of heat extracted uh, times the efficiency here. And we could plug that in in this kind of equation where the Q hot becomes the enthalpy because enthalpy is of course heat times the difference between the hot and cold over the hot. Um, we, we basically have taken delta G and put it into this similar form here by just saying delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S and pulling out a negative delta H. This allows us to just, just compare these two uh, terms here to see which one is better. If you plug in some typical things for uh, the lead acid battery used in a car, you find that you get about 3.3 times as much work out of a lead acid battery in electrical fashion than if we were to do a combustion reaction to accomplish the same change. Uh, so we'll now look at the lead acid battery and kind of get an idea for how it works. We can see the general reactions here. Um, a lead acid battery uses actually two different types of lead and then sulfuric acid, hence the name lead acid battery. So the cathode uses a lead oxide, and this is lead four oxide here, um, and it's in equilibrium with sulfuric acid. What happens is our lead oxide gains two electrons and becomes a lead two ion where it now pairs up with the sulfate 
and releases some water. At the anode, we go with metallic lead that loses two ions and actually also becomes lead sulfate. Um, and it loses two ions in the process. So we start with uh, lead four oxide and lead uh, pure metallic lead. We add sulfuric acid and go to two molecules of lead sulfate and two water molecules. And we can add up the half cell potentials and see that each of these uh, results in an approximately two volt uh, battery here. Typically, six of these cells are going to be combined in a car battery to get a 12 volt potential. What you'll note is that the anode and cathode both convert from one solid to another solid phase. So we're going from lead oxide to lead sulfate or lead to lead sulfate. Due to the differences in the solid crystal structures between these different types of uh, solids, it actually induces a mechanical stress on the anode and cathode. And so what happens over time is that this mechanical stress eventually causes a break uh, in the battery, which causes your battery to be less efficient. So there actually is a good reason physically why your car batteries die every five, six, seven years, depending on the battery, because they're actually just getting worn out from continual uh, charge and discharge cycles. This, has, this battery has a pretty high voltage, which means it actually gives a lot of energy. However, they're not typically useful for a lot of things that we use in our daily life. And this is mostly because lead is very heavy. Um, so you can see in this plot, it's talking about the uh, basically the, the energy density in mass compared to volume. And you can see the lead acid battery, while it releases a lot of energy, it takes a lot of mass and a lot of space to do that. So while it's pretty uh, efficient and has a high voltage, it wouldn't be very good to do things like power cell phones. Your cell phone would weigh uh, many times more than it did if you had to power with a heavy lead battery. Um, so instead, other batteries are used. You've probably heard of lithium ion batteries. It's the most uh, common kind of battery that's used in a lot of devices today. I'll go into a little bit more detail about alkaline batteries or your typical AA batteries that we're all very familiar with. Um, the AA batteries use uh, some sort of zinc and uh, manganese as their anode and cathode. So this, you can see here, this picture is the typical double A uh, alkaline battery here. Um, and it uses zinc at the anode uh, and equilibrium with some base. So we have zinc and uh, sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Um, and that goes to zinc oxide with a, a voltage of 1.1. And at the cathode, we have manganese oxide, manganese 4 oxide into a manganese 3 oxide. So the manganese is gaining one electron. But we also have uh, a water molecule where the oxygen is gaining one electron as well. Um, so our zinc is losing two. Um, to become zinc oxide, and we have some combination of manganese and water gaining those electrons. And this has a uh, reduction potential, uh, uh, its standard state of about 1.86. If you grab a AA battery and look at it, the voltage there is about 1.5, so they probably have a different, you know, non-standard concentrations uh, to achieve that. And we could get the ratio of the activities there if we uh, went ahead and ran uh, the Nernst equation. Um, you might be interested in knowing why batteries leak. I did a little bit of looking up for this, try to figure out what, what's happening where the batteries are leaking. And in this process of, of discharging the batteries, sometimes you can have a buildup of hydrogen that happens. Uh, and so when this hydrogen builds up, it can actually physically rupture the battery because you have this buildup of pressure. And that causes the uh, base um, to leak out. And that starts to to mess with, you know, you have base that's goes and corroding things and destroying things. So that's what happens when you like leave a device forever and then come back and it hasn't been used in years and it's all weird and crusty. It's the base leaking out of a burst battery there. Uh, well, briefly, we can look at uh, uh, lithium ion batteries. They're pretty weird and we can talk about these in class if you're interested. I'm not gonna go over them here because they don't necessarily use one-to-one -one relationships. So we have lithium ions and electrons being deposited in, in weird sort of ratios and you can see that here. Uh, but these are very light batteries that are also pretty efficient at getting energy. The last thing we'll mention today are fuel cells. Fuel cells offer an advantage over batteries in that they do not need to be recharged. Um, so they could accept a continuous supply of input. 
Um, fuel cells are mainly still in the R and D phase, not because they don't work, but because we can't really get them to be uh, economical. So hydrogen fuel cells were actually used in the Gemini space flights in the 60s to power the rockets. But the challenges to using these kind of fuel cells, say, to power a car, um, uh, there's a couple of them. So the first one is that hydrogen gas is a relatively low density fuel, unlike something like octane. It would take a lot of hydrogen to power the reaction, even though it'd be more efficient. Um, and then the other kind of thing is there might be some concerns, as you can imagine, in storing large quantities of flammable back gas in uh, an automobile that might, say, get rear-ended and then explode, and you probably wouldn't want that. Um, so these are the, the kind of challenges that uh, we're trying to overcome with fuel cell research. Uh, and the way that research is kind of going uh, these days is to try to figure out how to produce hydrogen at the site of the reaction so you don't have to store it using something that might be easier to store like methane or methanol. And that's all that I want to go into uh, talking about electrochemistry. So we went over in general how electrochemistry works. We can measure an EMF, an electromotive force, which is our E naught, our standard electrochemical potential for a, a process. And this can be used to relate it to very many other thermodynamic properties like Gibbs free energy, entropy. Uh, we can calculate the enthalpy from that. We get the equilibrium constant and so forth. Um, these electrochemical experiments are, are very easy to measure. We've seen some of this in lab. All you have to do is hook up a voltmeter to this and you can measure the voltage between two different uh, half cells. And we can do this and get lots of information like equilibrium constants for very favorable, very unfavorable reactions that we couldn't otherwise measure. And we can also get activity coefficients for dissolved ionic species, which is helpful. Electrochemical reactions are also very easily reversible. All you have to do is apply a strong uh, negative voltage and you get the reaction to go in the other way, which is very helpful for basically our modern way of life when we recharge our batteries and so forth. Um, and then we can utilize this electrochemical uh, uh, reactions to work more efficiently than in things like combustion engines. Uh, and these are done with typically batteries and people are working on fuel cells as well. So this kind of concludes our thermodynamics portion of CHEM 503. And what we'll be moving to in the next lecture is a pretty big change and in going into a probability. So we're gonna start embarking on a quest to figure out statistical thermodynamics or statistical mechanics, which is trying to explain a lot of the bulk properties that we've been talking about, temperature, pressure, Gibbs free energy, equilibrium constant and so forth, in terms of the micro energetics around individual molecules that make up the bulk systems that we've been studying. So it's gonna be a pretty big change, but I think it'll be a lot of fun.